Good afternoon, everyone. We will be getting started in about two or three minutes. Thank you for being here today. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nancy Larson. I'm the director with the K-State Pollution Prevention Institute. And I want to welcome you here today um, so that you can hopefully learn some new things about environmental permits and uh, figure out what is it you might need to know if you are a small business or uh, an entity that you think may need an environmental permit. Um, I want to um, thank uh, the SBA and the SBDC, especially Marcia Stevens for out of the Wichita office for inviting me to uh, present this information today. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you uh, recording this as well. So today, uh, my goal is, is just to provide you with this little bit of an outline and then go into the meat of this webinar. So First, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the background of our agency, because like uh, the SBDCs and other SBA services, we provide free and um, confidential technical assistance to small businesses. Um, and so you'll hear a little bit about our group called the Pollution Prevention Institute, and specifically the Small Business Environmental Assistance Program. Um, and then my real goal is to, regarding environmental permitting, is to give you some basic information to help you say, oh yes, I really need to look into that requirement and here's who I call, or you could say, oh good, that probably doesn't apply to me. So help you figure that out as we go through the multiple um, potentials for um, environmental compliance and permitting. Uh, that regard to air quality. We'll talk about hazardous waste. We'll talk about storm water, wastewaters, and tanks. And then um, you are welcome to use the chat function or raise your hand at any time if you have a question or if you would like a clarification on a point um, that um, I may be mentioned in the webinar. Uh, I also want you to feel free to, if I mention a document um, or you've got a specific question, our contact information will come up several times on the various slides today. And so I want you to feel free to write that down. Then you can send an email and say, hey, Nancy, would you mind sending me that document? I'll be happy to send you a link to, uh, to the document or 
other resources that I think may pertain to you. Um, so basically, we want to make sure we're giving you good resources today uh, to help you feel more confident with environmental compliance perm and permitting. Also training, because if some of these aspects, if you do need an air quality uh, permit, if you need a hazardous waste registration or, or a stormwater pollution prevention plan, there are some trainings required and we have several training free training resources on our website. Uh, they're very good for small businesses. Sometimes they don't apply to the larger businesses, but I at least wanna make sure that you know where you can go for some help. Uh, alrighty, so the first thing I'd like to do is we're gonna use some poll questions today and uh, Corey is assisting me. And so Corey, if you want to launch poll question one and two, we'll ask the audience to answer those. So we're a little new to polling on this webinar. There we go. So bear with us while we work with this. So what we're looking for in this first question in this first poll is for you to click on what type of business or agency you work for uh, and, um, and then um, the second question asks you to rank yourself on a scale from one to five, with five being uh, considered expert. Uh, how familiar you are with the environmental compliance regulations? And when I say environmental compliance regulations, what we're talking about when we say environmental is we're talking about the EPA KDHE regulations. Um, not the OSHA, not necessarily the health and safety regulations. So please make a single choice. They're ranking your knowledge. All right, and Corey, if you think um, people have voted, you can go ahead and show the results. There we go, perfect, manufacturing. All right, that helps me know um, uh, where to speak to. And Corey, if you can use the scroll bar to scroll down on the second answer. It's just on the right-hand frame of the poll. It'll allow you just to scroll down And I think I'm able to do that. Okay, great. Um, so right, uh, right, ranked right in the middle as far as the knowledge goes. Thank you, that's very helpful. I'm gonna close that since it's allowing me to do that as a presenter. All righty. So uh, first a little bit about who we are. We are the Pollution Prevention Institute. We're actually out of Kansas State University um, the College of Engineering, and our group is a mix of engineers and environmental health specialists. Um, we have been around since about 1989, so a little more than 30 years. Uh, and we have a, a pollution prevention program, which includes an intern program. I will mention that um, towards the end of our presentation, but my big focus today is the program um, that I'm going to talk about that does it focuses on environmental permitting and compliance. And that is the Small Business Environmental Assistance Program, or often called SB. We have um, uh, hosted the Kansas SB program um, since 1995. And it's actually mandated under the Clean Air Act Amendments of 1990. Um, this program is funded uh, in part by the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. They are the regulatory authority in Kansas for EPA um, um, federal regulations, such as RICRA, Clean Air Act, and uh, so they, and stormwater. They've got the primacy to uh, be the arm that does the regulatory authority that comes in and does the inspection. So if you are going to see an inspector, you're usually gonna see them 
from KDHE, or you hope you are, because you don't necessarily want to see the EPA inspectors. All right, with that said, this is our team across the state. Um, we're, we're small, but we've actually really grown quite a bit in the last couple of years. And, um, and so uh, Lena and Arthur going left to right there, uh, as well as on the far right hand J uh, side, Jacob, they are all out of our Manhattan area. Uh, and so uh, Jacob is brand new to our group, has the same last name as me, but no relation. <laughs> Uh, and uh, Linnell Ladd is in uh, a Topeka office. Uh, uh, I was hired as the director or, uh, to uh, work out of a Wichita office. I've been the director for uh, several years now. Allison works out of a um, Kansas City office and, and Abby is our uh, graphic artist. And I thank her for polishing my presentation here today. Uh, but um, some folks work out of their home, many work out of the main office. I work out of uh, the um, K-State Research and Extension Office here in Wichita. And so um, we work in a variety of programs. And you'll hear me reference the different specialists with regard to where our specialties are, our expertise with regard to the regula regulations. So we have a couple of mission statements, but basically we promote sustainability through environmental education and services to industry, institutions, and communities. So our programming is mostly industry focused. That's what we do. We work with industry. We do do some other side programs too, where we work with some schools on food waste and some other institutions on, on food waste or certain toxics reduction, but mainly we work with industry and serving them. So I, I mentioned to you that the main program I want to talk to you to, about today is the Small Business Environmental Assistance Program. Um, this is our Environmental Permitting and Compliance Program, funded, like I said, by KDHE. So we're kind of that non-regulatory arm of KDHE, um, where KDAL, Kansas Department of Labor, is the non-regulatory arm of OSHA, and will come in and do some of these uh, free OSHA types of services for your facility. Um, uh, we are the non-regulatory arm of KDHE, and we provide those same types of services, but only with regard to environmental permitting, not OSHA. Our services are multimedia, meaning a lot of clients might call me uh, because they've got a hazardous waste question. But as I work with them and I realize they've got a paint booth, um, or they've got some other um, pieces of equipment, air emission equipment, we figure out, do they need an air permit too? Or maybe they need a, a stormwater permit. Um, we also look to help them uh, with suggestions on how they might improve their processes to save money. We're always trying to help small businesses uh, save money. Um, so we work with small, medium-sized businesses, fewer than 100 employees is typically who we work with under this program. As I mentioned before, it is free. It is confidential. We do not report to KDHG who we go out to work with unless the client would like us to and gives us permission to do that. Many times the client wants us to talk to KDHG or kind of be the liaison between um, them and KDHG because we talk the same regulatory language and then we can come back to the small business and help them uh, understand what the requirements are. Um, all of our tools that I'm going to show you today, our calculator tools that we've got, our fact sheets, the different training um, tools that we have, they are all approved by KDHE. They go through uh, a, a rigorous internal technical review, then they go to KDHE to be approved before we post them on our website. You can see our contact information there. There's our website, simply sbeep.org. We've got an 800 number and you can email us too. Um, but we are known as SBEEP. Um, uh, and remember how I said these programs were started as a result of the Clean Air Act amendments of 1990. Well, Kansas is not the only one with an SB program. 
So we have similar programs uh, across most states. So a lot of times companies will call and they'll say, well, we're doing that here in Kansas, but in Texas, Nancy, we have these regulations. And so I will connect them with their Texas SB contact so they can get help with that. Um, and that is a big advantage. So we all, we actually nationally have a stakeholder group. We share resources uh, because we work with a lot of similar regulatory issues so that we can best help our clients. And there's a lot of great synergy that we have um, with our small business development centers, with KDHE and with OSHA. So we also try to work with those partners because a lot of times the SBBCs will refer people to us, we will refer people to them. Um, um, we, uh, KDHE often refers people to us and um, OSHA or KDOL also refer people. Um, so my apologies for a lot of acronyms, but that, that is the environmental world there. I think you know most of those acronyms. Uh, I do want to share with you that this is our website here. And so um, on our website, it's really easy. You can just, I'll, I'll show that to you again in a second, but you can go in and ask a question from there. Um, you can see that the way our site is set up, if you've got an air quality problem, you're able just to jump right on uh, air quality, water quality, waste management. This is hazardous waste too. Uh, and then look at these other events. We have some shortcuts down here. Let's say you just need to know about storage tanks. So you can go to those shortcuts uh, right there. But we um, have some featured compliance tools. So when we develop new tools, we not only put them under the specific area like air quality, but we also put them under featured compliance tools. Um, we have a newsletter as well you can sign up for. They are just very short uh, newsletters that then, if you're interested, will link you on to other resources. We often promote free trainings or upcoming regulatory trainings or even new regulations that we know are gonna impact our clients. We, uh, that is kind of a feature of what we call our Kansas e-tips. So let's say you call us for some help. This is what the typical technical assistance looks like. Uh, first, you'll just be screened, um, unless you know who to ask for. Uh, our, re our receptionist or our support person who answers the phone will screen your call to determine what your main need is, and then she will direct it to the correct um, specialist. Sometimes you just need a form, you need some guidance. Um, we have... Um, um, applicability or with different permitting, or sometimes people need help calculating what's called the PTE, potential to emit. Sounds difficult, but we make it pretty easy for you. Um, if your request is time sensitive, you can let us know that too, and we will do our best to get you an answer. We typically then will get your email um, because we'll want to link the various different resources that we wanna make sure you know about. But let's say you need a little more help, then sometimes what we'll do is we'll meet with you either by Zoom um, or we'll set up an on-site visit because we do do several of these on-site visits each year where we'll literally do a walk through your facility and we will help you, if you depending on what your focus of your question is, We'll always start to answer that question first and start in that area, but we will be happy to do a full walkthrough to help you identify some other compliance gaps or what we call opportunities. And then we'll provide you with a short report, any of the um, permitting forms you might need, or, uh, and we'll help you identify your priority. So oftentimes we'll say, well, we think you should work on this first, the next, this one, and then once you're done with those, start working on this other element, which might be the stormwater. So um, we do try to schedule. We're careful about how we schedule uh, because we want to be very good um, stewards of uh, our environmental footprint as well as our funding. So with that said, um, Corey, can you launch poll three or what would be the third question? I think it would be your poll two.
Great. And what I'd like folks to do here is just answer the first question. So the first question says, check the types of environmental permits you already have or you need to learn about today. And you're able to check, uh, you should be able to check um, as many boxes as you need to, all that apply. And don't worry about answering the second question because we're actually going to launch that separately a little bit later. Okay, Corey, if you want to show the results. I'm just waiting on a few more people to answer it. On my end, it's not. Okay, there we go. There the answers are. Okay, great. Okay, cool. thank you. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. All right, great. That helps me know where to focus. So air permitting, hazardous waste, wastewater. All righty, thank you so much for that information. Okay. So now we're going to get into the meat of um, our presentation here is who needs a permit? What permit do you need? Uh, what are the regulations? Where can I find training? Where can I find, find um, uh, these tools? And so um, who needs a permit? Just generally entities that generate certain, not all air emissions, but certain emissions that would go to the environment. I'll give you some examples in just a minute, but these would be air emissions. So certainly like a paint booth, or maybe you've got some machining equipment um, that emits particulate matter um, so uh, to the environment through a stack. Uh, so those would be certain air emissions, certain hazardous, all just have pretty much all waste that would be considered hazardous waste. And it's not everything, but um, hazardous waste or certain solid waste even. Storm water, which does apply to pretty much everyone in manufacturing or, um, or uh, material handling. Um, certain wastewaters, not all wastewaters, but certain wastewaters. And then if you use an above or below ground storage tank. Um, these permits, a lot of times people think, oh, this only applies to large business. Well, no, it is based on the processes and what you do. So it can be anywhere from a real small business. I've had a ma and pa dry cleaners, auto body shops, all the way to large industries, aerospace manufacturers, et cetera. Um, it really just depends. And it is up to you as the business to determine, do I need a permit? If I do, um, then um, once I file it, what are my compliance obligations? What are my reporting obligations? So it is not up to KDHE or our program to come knock on your door and say, hey, you probably need this. It is actually your responsibility as a business owner or business operator to know whether or not these permits apply to you. Um, we also um, know that these permits and requirements apply sometimes to institutions like hospitals because they have some of the same types of processes Maybe that an industry does. Um, we know that schools and governments also uh, are required to make these assessments and possibly have these uh, permits. Why? The bottom line is protection of human health and the environment. And then who in Kansas permits people? It's KDHE. And Marsha will be sending out a uh, copy of this presentation afterwards. So all these links will be active for you. Uh, so next, let's, so we're going to start first with air quality, because if you need any permit, you typically need to apply for an air quality permit first. Processes or equipment should be permitted before they are operated. And I say should be, that does not always happen. And we can certainly help people if they've had something installed and operating for a long time and they find out they should have had a permit. Um, and then we want to talk about how do we get started with this, right? 
Uh, we've got a great document I'm going to show you in just a second. And then I'm also going to show you our website where we've got some tools and some training that will help you figure out air permitting. Air permitting is probably the more complicated regulation that companies are going to have to deal with. And so we um, initially have ha always had a lot of uh, more funding from our air quality section at KDHE to develop permits and or develop calculators and different training tools um, than we had for some of the other areas like hazardous waste and water. Uh, that is not so much true anymore. We have some equal, equal types of funding, but we um, have many, many tools on our air quality uh, pages that uh, we want to make sure you are familiar with. And so getting started with air quality, one of the best places to go is this document I just showed you on the slide, and I've now pulled up in front of, this, of the slides. And so it's called five steps to determining whether your facility needs an air permit or not. And so I'm gonna go through this a little fast and generally, but then that gives you that idea, oh gosh, I need to look into this further. I, maybe need to uh, give SPEEP a call about this, or, it, oh, this doesn't really apply to me. So this document describes the um, requirements and, and what um, uh, is permitted. And then it talks about, you know, how do you get started? The first step is to make a list of what we call your emission units or emission sources and emission sources. And so they can be any of these items that you see here, right? So one of your emission sources could be painting, maybe your welding, maybe you've got degreasing tanks um, or degreasing processes, so solvent uh, emissions, right? We've got what we call volatile organics and hazardous air pollutants that are regulated that are emitted from these processes. Um, certain types of vents or valves Abrasive blasting uh, is something that emits particulate matter, and that has to be calculated. Uh, fortunately, we have tools to calculate all these types of things. When we talk about burn-off ovens, and we talk about uh, cure ovens, not sure if that's on here or not, but a lot of times if you're painting coating, you've got to put something through a, a cure oven, and that is um, natural gas fire. And so we've got calculators to figure out, you know, what are the um, nitrous oxides that come off of that? And do they meet the permit thresholds where I would actually need a permit for that cure of it? But you, just like many other things, is you figure out individually uh, what, needs a, um, what needs a determination or, uh, on the um, emissions, and then you can add them up for your facility. Um, that's what we call a facility-wide emission assessment. Um, once you decide, you know, what are my emissions, there are calculations that can be done. This handout gives you just some really simple, straightforward examples of how we do calculations for uh, different types of material. But we do have um, Excel spreadsheet calculator tools that if you put in the right information um, will actually calculate everything for you. So then you take your results and just like anything else, you compare them to what might be the permitting threshold. And remember in air quality where I said, you need to look at this first because um, these permits are actually certain things that you have to have in place uh, before you actually start operating the process. So that's what we call a construction approval or construction permit. They should be in place before you're operating. And then we have these other permits that are called operating permits. Um, this is more complicated than I would want to get into today, but what I do want to share with you um, is our website, which can help demystify uh, some of these complicated issues 
with regard to air quality. So when you go to our website, looks like this, you hover over air quality. Um, there are some really good training resources here. We've got, you know, air permitting overviews, and then it goes through, you know, what are some um, uh, KDHE uh, site inspections. We have this full curriculum here that introduces you to um, air permitting. I have a little bit of a slow internet connection, so my videos often do not show up, but trust me, the videos are all right here. We also have a YouTube site where um, all those videos are posted too. But the emission calculators that I mentioned to you are all under emission calculators. These, um, many of these do come with little tutorials so painting and coating, welding, abrasive blasting, plasma and laser cutting, right? So if you're manufacturing, machining, you may have plasma laser cutter uh, equipment. It, um, it help, this tool helps you walk through what data do I enter? And then when you enter the data at the end, you're able to see that um, the results in the summary, and it actually pops up and says, hey, you need a construction permit you need an operating permit. So we have various tools here I won't go through necessarily, um, but do know that if you're in Johnson or Wyandotte County, you have some um, extra requirements related to certain uh, emissions called volatile organic compounds. Uh, so I highly recommend that if you have a question about this, you do give us a call. Uh, because we can kind of walk you through this and it can be a little bit um, confusing. So do you need help calculating your emissions? Do you need help with the permit paperwork? I didn't go through that, but on our website, if you decide you need a permit, it's all linked. Everything is just linked right there to take you to KDHE's website so you can get a permit. Um, uh, if you have questions, I recommend that you call our hotline or email us. Um, Linnell and Allison are our two air quality contacts, and you're welcome to ask for them by name. So hazardous waste is next because most facilities know whether or not they generate hazardous waste. That's pretty straightforward, but uh, sometimes air quality is a little bit of a mystery. But with all the regulations and performance standards under hazardous waste, um, they are not always straightforward. So we wanna introduce you to just some of these concepts and what you need to do if you think you generate hazardous waste and you don't already have a compliance program in place. Uh, so if you're a small business and you need some help with that, please feel free to call us. But basically in Kansas, across the United States and under what's called the Resource Conservation Recovery, um, uh, Resource Con Conservation Recovery Act, um, we, all entities that generate hazardous waste must be identified, uh, must identify, classify, and quantify their waste. The quantity of hazardous waste generated, sometimes what's stored on site or accumulated as well, um, that's what dictates a certain category that you fall into. The category you fall into dictates what your performance and registration standards are. KDHE Bureau of Waste Management is the group that regulates hazardous waste permits in Kansas. And in Kansas, we have four different categories. The four, um, four categories um, regulate waste starting at an amount generated at uh, 55 pounds in a calendar month um, or less. Um, that's 55 pounds. A lot of people, what is that? It's not a 55 gallon drum. No, a uh, 55 gallon drum can weigh 400 pounds. 55 pounds would be about a five gallon bucket, depending on the type of material that you have that is hazardous waste. 
So the size of the category dictates your uh, requirement for notification. Um, most of these categories have to notice with one, uh, provide a notification with one exception. And that's conditionally exempt small quantity generators. Um, either um, there's two different categories under this. One is for those who accumulate and one is for those who do not. But if um, you're a Kansas small quantity generator, small quantity generator, large quantity generator, you have to get an EPID number uh, in order to dispose of your waste. And in order to do that, you fill out what's called a notification of regulated waste activity. We get a lot of questions about this. Uh, a lot of times your vendor will help you with this, but you're signing all these forms. And so you also need to know what you are signing what type of information is going on this permit registration or what we call notification of regulated waste activity. Um, it's very important because you're, you're signing to say, yes, indeed, we have this waste and um, this is how it needs to be managed. So all generators are required to be trained because they have to be able to determine, is this really a hazardous waste or not? Uh, we are, are very good at helping clients determine whether waste is hazardous or not, walking you through what we call a hazardous waste determination. And so if you need help with that, please feel free to call our hotline or email us. Um, I am the, um, the hazardous waste contact in the office. And right now I am training, um, I am training Jacob on hazardous waste. So let me just show you a couple of things about our hazardous waste page, because we've kind of grouped some things under what we call waste management. And under waste management, um, we have a, a new program called sustainable material management uh, that works really with helping people eliminate problematic food or uh, solid waste uh, programs. Then we have a hazardous waste regulatory compliance program, that's mainly what we're talking about here. And um, I'll have you notice on these pages, you can click here to email us anytime, uh, but we've got a hazardous waste handler training program right here. We have a compliance calendar we develop every year for uh, um, KDHE, it helps you keep certain records and it gives you all kinds of tips, it's downloadable here. And then we have uh, a training video, a short training video on container management and one under development for hazardous waste determinations. So uh, most of the assistance that we give under this is people calling our hotline or asking us to come out to their facility to help them figure out what do, you know, do I have hazardous waste, Nancy? What is it? What do I have to do now? How can I get rid of it? And please know that when you are a, um, oops, I'm gonna back up just a little bit. When you are in these categories, these lower two categories of conditionally exempt or Kansas small quantity generator, you have most, most communities, most counties have op <clears throat> options that are lower cost options to get rid of your hazardous waste through an appointment with the Household Hazardous Waste Program. So if you'd like to know more about that, just give us a call. Take a break for a drink here. Okay, this um, next section talks about stormwater permits. So although this was not clicked as an area of concern in the poll earlier, um, I can tell you that manufacturing does need to have a stormwater permit. Um, these are also called NPDESs, uh, National Pollutant Discharge uh, Emission Standard. Uh, and um, that's kind of the formal name for them, kind of a mouthful. So we call them stormwater permits. Uh, for small businesses, and they're kind of this general category of stormwater permits. Some industry sectors like ready-mixed concrete or um, other sectors are under specific stormwater requirements just because of their discharges. But these stormwater permits are required 
um, due to any regulate, regulated discharge of stormwater off uh, from certain types of industrial activity. So even at a manufacturing facility where you've got things stored in the parking lot or out the back, um, uh, you know, out in the back. So maybe you work with a lot of, of metals and things and metals are being stored out in the back. Um, so these are categories that material handling, manufacturing, transportation, production. Um, so even the stormwater running off your parking lot um, or hitting your material that's stored out the back, um, that is regulated stormwater and actually needs to be controlled and permitted. <clears throat> uh, what I recommend um, is that you take a look at our guidance document that we have on our website called Storm Water um, from Industry Activity. It's a guide to general uh, permitting, and it's got all kinds of links in here for getting you the information that you need. So most industries, even small businesses, will need to file for a stormwater permit. And this two-page fact sheet is a good introductory guidance for what is needed. Um, I've referenced then down here is that that's kind of the first step is filling out what's called a notice of intent. You might have heard it called an NOI before. So um, if you have all your material under cover, so uh, or you're not storing things outside in your in your uh, parking lot, you know, other than obviously your employees' cars that come and go you may qualify for what's called a no exposure exemption. You still fill out a notice of intent, but you check the box that says you're, you're applying for a no exposure. Um, and you send that in, the cost is $60 a year. Um, if you qualify for a no exposure, if that is accepted, then you do not have to take the second step. But for the most part, most industries do need to store things outside. And um, so they don't qualify for that no exposure. So they need to create a stormwater pollution prevention plan or what's um, often is known as a SWP3. So there are templates from EPA available. And the one I have linked here is, is good but it is a little more complicated than a lot of small businesses may need. We are in the midst of developing a Kansas specific template so that you can download it and pretty much fill in certain blanks to personalize it for your facility. Um, so um, Arthur or Lena are the people to contact with regard to stormwater. They also are the people to contact with regard to wastewater permits. But let me just uh, summarize this um, and talk about wastewater permits a little bit, uh, because these can be very specific to metal finishing industries or commercial laundry facilities. Um, but at an industry or business, anything other than domestic sewage, so that's toilet water, sink water, kitchen water, uh, anything other than that going down the drain, so your aqueous parts washer, or maybe you've got some other things that go down the drain periodically, they either require a permit or written approval from your, uh, what we call POTW or sewer authority. These programs are often considered a pretreatment program. So if you're in Wichita, Kansas, you're working with the city of Wichita's pretreatment uh, program, and you also see an inspector once or twice a year, but they are issued by the local authority. If you are working rurally and your wastewater treatment plant can't handle your discharges, um, then you'll often deal with the state uh, a regulatory authority, and I've linked that here. Um, but it is a good idea if you have questions about this to contact your local plant first. And like I mentioned, Arthur and Lena in our office are the two regulatory um, experts in this area. So um, finally, I wanna talk a little bit about storage tanks because we have been able to 
develop quite a few uh, resources, especially for underground storage tanks. This is regulated by the Bureau of Environmental Remediation. Um, there are two different kinds of tanks, above ground and underground storage tanks. Above ground storage tanks are permitted annually if the size of the tank is 660 or greater. Underground storage tanks are, are um, permitted differently. And a lot of times we're gonna find underground storage tanks obviously at convenience stores or gas stations. They hold petroleum products. Sometimes they hold solvents or other uh, types of fuels. And like I said, they do require an annual registration. Um, the two people in our office who uh, work with this are Allison and Arthur. And let me just give you a little preview of uh, from a water. First, I, I'll just, um, I'll go back here to our tanks page. And we have quite a bit on underground storage tanks. We actually have a compliance calendar that helps the, these groups know what kinds of records they need to keep when, what kinds of trainings are needed. Um, we've got um, uh, different types of videos here uh, that help you. And we actually have them in several different languages too. Here's some information, a very good guidance on above ground storage tanks, if that applies to you. Just toggling back to water quality, um, this is the NPDES page uh, that I mentioned. Here's the handout I mentioned and some other information about some of our program here. All righty. So with that said, looks like we've got just about 15 minutes left. And um, I'm just going to pause and see if, Corey, there are any questions that have come up. Uh, there are no questions in the chat right now. Okay, thank you, Corey. Mm -hmm. All right, as I kind of wrap it up here in the next few minutes, uh, let me tell you what a typical technical ex assistance example might look like. So this is a manufacturing company. We, um, we work with a lot of different manufacturing, obviously, in Kansas. I'm always amazed as what all is, uh, is actually being produced and exported uh, from our great state here. 42 employees, they call us requesting help with air permitting. We screen the client to figure out, you know, a lot of times that people call us and they're just not sure what I need. I, I know I might need an air permit, but I, I really don't know much more than that. So then we ask certain questions to try to understand, um, you know, what triggered their call, what's concerning them, what, what are their processes? A lot of times, like I said before, we do get referrals from KDHE. Sometimes we have referrals from KDHE where we're told, you know, this company has 30 days to get us a written compliance um, um, response because maybe you've been inspected and there's been some um, non-compliance uh, items noted and you need some help, a little extra help understanding how you can comply or you know you need to be um, have a permit right away. So KDHE may give you a short timeline or they may refer you to us. We don't typically call small businesses. Um, we wait for that small business to call us and ask for the help. We're going to ask about your processes, record what all your processes are. Do you have engines? Do you have generators? Are you blasting? Are you painting? Are you welding? And then we'll schedule uh, an on-site visit and we'll help you figure out what kinds of things do you need to have ready so that when we come, we can be as efficient with your time uh, and vice versa as possible. When we come to your facility, we will tour your facility. We'll do a wrap up meeting. We'll sometimes we'll sit down with you and we'll teach you, you know, um, section three and nine of the SDS are the sections that you need to look at to get the information for 
certain uh, calculator tools or, or hazardous waste determinations. Then we'll follow up with a, a short report that is going to link um, you to some resources that we talked about, or perhaps there was some research we needed to do for you, and we'll get you that research. But typically, we're going to answer 80% of your questions um, when we are on site. A lot of times, folks will call us for uh, one thing like an air permit, but we'll, we'll focus on that first. But then as we walk through, we'll point out some other compliance opportunities, like I said before. Sometimes you need a little extra help with the paperwork. We might schedule a Zoom so that we can interactively help you fill out that paperwork. Um, we do not report to KDHE that we're working with you unless you ask us to. If you want us to do that, um, then we will be happy to do that, but we will ask for that in writing from you because our program is confidential. Uh, and then um, we will try to do a follow-up with you uh, within a short period after. It's kind of a customer satisfaction survey, but we're also looking at, you know, if you were recommended to um, um, change this process or you know, make sure you've got um, container management in place, did you do those things? Did you do the training? We're looking for what are the compliance rates? What are the maybe waste reduction rates based on recommendations that we may have made? Um, and so uh, I just want to mention this program. I want to introduce you to it. It's one other program that we, we have, and it tends to serve larger industries, but our services are also available to small entities. The Pollution Prevention Program strives to help companies find um, um, ways, to re ways to reduce waste or emissions at the source. So for example, let's say you've got a problematic waste stream. Maybe it's problematic because of the volume of waste that you have and, and then the cost to get rid of it. Um, and maybe it's creating an extra regulatory burden for you. Uh, a lot of times that does happen. Our program will help you find ways to change the material, to change the process or change the technology to reduce the waste at the source, to prevent it basically. And then we'll also help you put a cost benefit to that as well as an environmental benefit. Uh, so how many pounds of solid waste were reduced? How many pounds of raw material were saved? Um, what is the, how, how many dollars were saved? Uh, what are the metric tons of CO2 equivalents that we were reduced or prevented? So the, um, we use um, engineering and environmental science interns that we train and we place with industry uh, each summer. This summer, we have 12 interns that we'll be placing with industries across the state who have signed up for this program. Um, and as a result of our program, we've got more than 90 industry case studies on our website, along with video presentations. And the idea is that there may be, if you're manufacturing, if you are uh, in aerospace, there's all kinds of case studies there. You can take a look and you can see, hmm, what did Decumen uh, Aerospace do um, last year? And you know, did they implement it? What were the recommendations? And then what were the cost savings? What were the environmental savings from that? And maybe if you're an aerospace company, you'll be able to implement those same types of things. So the idea is for other companies to learn from this. So check out our videos, check out our case studies if you're interested. And if you have questions about this or need help with this, um, we are happy to provide you with one-on-one -on -one assistance. This is a little view of what our clients say about us. Um, um, we, we do do these evaluations, as I mentioned before, but 90% indicate their initial concerns were um, resolved as a result of us working with them. Um, they rank our services very high. They recommend us to other businesses. 67% of the compliance recommendations that we put in our reports and we ask people about have been implemented when we do follow up and 73% of the pollution prevention or waste reduction recommendations um, uh, were implemented. This is a result of a 
um, evaluation study that we did uh, last fall. So with that, I'll just wrap up with our contact information again. And, and my name, Nancy Larson, I'm the director with the Pollution Prevention Institute, but anyone from our team is happy to help you with environmental uh, permitting or pollution prevention. There are a few questions that I'm seeing that I can. Great. Okay, so the first one, someone asked, how soon are appointments available for a site visit? Right, so it kind of depends on which media. I've got a couple of site visits next week, but um, um, usually it's gonna be anywhere from, you know, we might be able to come out in, in one week or if your problem isn't um, as immediate and we're gonna be in the area in three weeks, we might schedule it with that. So we'll also take a look at how much travel there is, what other types of things we might need to do and then who needs to do it. So anywhere from one to three weeks. Okay, I think that kind of maybe answered the next question. Someone asked how far in advance does it take for an on-site visit? Mm -hmm. And what you'll do is you'll just contact us and say, hey, Nancy, uh, here's my main questions. I'd like you to do a walkthrough to sometimes people just, especially new businesses, can you do a walkthrough to help us understand, do we have anything that applies to us? You know, uh, we're not sure. And so um, we're happy to do that. So the first step is just to email or call us. We'll send you what's called a pre-assessment form. Um, it's just a, a little one page, two sided document that asks you, you know, what are you concerned about? How many employees do you have? Who, you know, who's the contact, the address, that type of thing. And then it gives us permission to come to your site. We actually ask you to sign the back, giving us permission to come on site. Cool. And then the last question was, is using acrylic paint for crafts the paint encoding process? Uh, yeah, so usually if you're talking about using it for crafts, like uh, which would be an art business, right? That type of thing is what I'm kind of assuming. It all depends on how also you are applying it. So a lot of times in that case, you might be applying it with a brush. But if you're doing any kind of a spray painting, uh, that's when we all have a lot of um, aerosols that might volatilize. And uh, that's when, and if you're doing any kind of volume, then um, that's when you need to account for your uh, air emissions. Uh, the other part of that is we would just need to look at the um, SDSs related to those paints. And we can do that you know, by email sometimes for you too, just to make sure that there aren't certain things in those paints that would be considered a hazardous waste if you had either excess paint that you needed to get rid of or you had um, uh, solvent you needed to clean your equipment in and then dispose of. All right, those were the only questions in the chat. So I think we're good on that. Great. Um, I think that we did not do that last poll. Would you mind putting that last poll up, Corey? Yes. Thank you. So this last poll just asked you the same question I asked you in number two, um, but. Um, what we want you to do is we're trying to measure whether people learned anything here or not. And so using the same scale that you used earlier from one to five, um, rank you know, what you learned today, how familiar you are with uh, compliance regulations. So we're hoping that you were able to learn um, some today and that you're feeling a little more confident about where you can go for help. And whenever you say, Corey. All right, I'll go ahead and end the poll. Great, some improvement there. Thank you so much. All right, well, with that, um, I want to thank, um, uh, Corey and Marsha 
and the SBDC and the SBA for um, uh, facilitating and hosting this uh, webinar today. And um, until next time, we'll see you later. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. I will go ahead and end the webinar now. Thank you. Mm -hmm.